Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. This is Heidi from My Reading Life and I'm here today to film a recent reads video. So these are four titles that I've read in the month of November that I have yet to talk about and so I thought I would just update you with these four books and sort of where I'm at with my reading. So um, all three of these are nonfiction and one is a fiction title. So uh, most of these are for nonfiction November and one of these is for Skoden Readathon. So the first book is a nonfiction November title. This is Giving a Damn, Racism, Romance, and Gone with the Wind by Patricia Williams. I listened to this on audiobook uh, through Scribd and it is read by the author herself. And it's very short, it's like three plus hours. It's less than four hours. And it's sort of a, um, it's a, not really an essay collection, but it, each chapter explores different topics around racism and how that relates to sort of popular culture and current political events happening today and how a lot of those current political events, whether you're talking about immigration or culture wars or, you know, just other types of political topics that are of, you know, high uh, visibility today, a lot of them have their roots in this unexplored, undiscussed history of racism in the United States. So for example, Gone with the Wind is a book that is, continues to be extremely popular today. And many people are resistant to talking about the ways in which Gone with the Wind sort of props up and apologize, apologizes for white supremacy and the enslavement of black people. Um, and Patricia Williams, because she's a legal scholar in her, in her day job, um, really is quite well equipped to discuss this topic. I found this book, the topics and the themes are very interesting to me. Of course, I've done a lot of um, reading in this topic area over the last few years, but I will say I did not 100% um, enjoy the audiobook experience. I think that um, Williams is not, uh, is very flat in her affect, so it made the, the audiobook a little bit less engaging to me. I probably would have enjoyed this book more had I read it in the physical copy. But if you like the themes and the topics, I certainly can uh, recommend it. And then the second book I want to discuss is this one, Oak Flat, A Fight for Sacred Land in the American West by Lauren Redness. Now, in my TBR, I had talked about this book as a book that I wanted to read for Skoda and Readathon, as well as Nonfiction November, because this is a nonfiction um, graphic work. And uh, what I found out after starting to read this is that the author is not Indigenous, so it does not count for the Skoda and Readathon. But it does address indigenous issues because what Redness is doing here is talking with some folks, some families that were impacted, who have been impacted by the um, attempts to develop a sacred area in what's currently known as Arizona, but is sacred land to um, uh, several Apache tribes that live in that area. So this area of Oak Flat, there's some multinational companies, there's been mining in this area in the past, and there's a, a big company, a big mining corporation, multinational corporation that wants to come in and create a copper mine in this location. And it's a, it would be a, um, a mine that would create a huge pit in the ground exactly where this Oak Flat is. And Oak Flat is a sacred site to the Apache. They do many ceremonies there and it's just a piece of their homeland that, that has been used for, you know, millennia to do different activities. And so of course they are not interested in having this piece of land developed as a copper mine. And so the author talks to very many people who are impacted both on the Apache side and also in the white community um, and talks to them about their concerns or their hopes and fears as it relates to mining. Um, and so I had picked this book for element because of the fact that it's about copper mining and copper being an element. Um, and it also explores elements of spirituality. There's a particular scene in here that discusses um, a coming of age ceremony that young Apache girls go through that has to do with fertility and things like that and just becoming a woman. And the way it's described in this book is, it's incredibly, incredibly beautiful. I will also say that the illustrations throughout this book really enhance, um, really enhance the enjoyment of, of the reading that you're doing. So yeah, I really enjoy the, the reading of this book. Thank you to Karen, uh, Karen at Run Right Read. She sent me this book as a gift um, and I, I did very much enjoy it. And I think 
I'm really interested in these stories about environmental justice, particularly from a minority perspective when um, companies are coming in and trying to do resource extraction and how it impacts uh, in either indigenous communities or other minority communities. I think that's a really important topic area and one for all of us to pay attention to. Um, and for us to have discussions about um, what in modern life is worth giving up in order to preserve certain spaces. And uh, I think that's a, a discussion point that we probably all should be having more often. Then the next book I want to discuss is a book for Scott and Readathon, and that is this story collection, Night of the Living Res by Morgan Talty, which I buddy read with Sean the Book Maniac. We read one story a week over the course of 12 weeks because there's 12 stories in here. Um, and this book <laughs> is so good. It is so good. So Morgan Talty is a member of the Penobscot Nation, uh, which is a tribe that is uh, part within what we currently know as the state of Maine. Um, their homeland stretches throughout the watershed of the Penobscot River. And Talty grew up in on the reservation in uh, that the Penobscots currently live on. And his stories are center around a family. So all of the stories are connected. And the main character that we're following is David. And we follow David throughout his life, not in a linear way, uh, but in a way where in one story, he's a small boy. In another story, he's a 20 year old or a teenager. And through these episodic stories in his life, we get a picture of his family and the challenges that they face. Um, there's a lot of trauma that happens. Um, there's a lot of dark things that happen, but there's also a lot of humor. One thing I really enjoyed about these stories is that even though the topics could be very dark, the humor shines through, the descriptions of the place are very strong. There is, right in the very first story, there's a description about walking along a snow-packed sidewalk and the, the river being frozen over and shining in the moonlight. And <laughs> it was just so evocative. And I feel like I have lived that scene in my life so many times myself, or I have seen that scene so many times myself in my life. And it just really was very evocative of place. And all of the stories have little moments like that, that take you to the place that he's describing. So good. He is very realist in its description. This isn't, um, even though the, the stories do talk, uh, do touch on some supernatural elements, they bring in some native myths and legends. Um, it's never in a way that feels overtly supernatural. It's just in a way that feels very true to the story, feels very much woven into the fabric of these people's lives. And the characters are very, very strong in the story. As we learn about each of them throughout the different stories, you get, you gain pieces of knowledge, you gain um, understanding of what's happening with these folks. And the other thing that I really liked about this was that um, nobody is black and white. Nobody is a good character. Nobody is an evil character. Like there's elements of good and bad in every person that you encounter. And that is just so much more real to life, right? True to life. Um, these stories do touch on topics of addiction, um, of abuse, and other traumatic events that happen. Um, so if that's something that you aren't interested in, you know, just take that as the warning. Um, but I love this. And I am not a, story, a short story person at all. That's not, that's not the place where I tend to enjoy spending my time. I loved this story collection. I felt very emotional in a lot of the stories. I felt very invested in the characters. Um, I was really rooting for David throughout this story and I really wanted to know more about why people were making the decisions they were making. And um, I think that the way Talty lays it out is really powerful and just well done. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing what else he does in the future and reading more um, more stuff by him in, in the future. I will say I listened to him speak in a um, some kind of a public event where he was promoting his book and through the course of the interview he was asked about um, the elements of Penobscot life and Penobscot culture that are in this book and he made a very profound statement I think in which he talked about how he does not feel like 
he, de he thinks that the, the media around his book and the PR around his book has really promoted this, this idea that his book is representative of Penobscot culture, and he does not feel that way. He feels that it's, it's just a sliver, just a sliver of how people might live um, in the Penobscot community, and that he never meant to write a book that was representative of all aspects of Penobscot culture, and he wishes that you know, the media would not talk about his collection that way, that he, it's not, it's not fair to him and it's not fair to the stories and it's not fair to the Penobscots as a culture. Um, and it was not anything he ever intended to do is represent an entire culture with his one book. And I thought that was like, yeah, like, obviously we shouldn't expect people, authors, anyone, like they can't embody every aspect of a culture just with their one thing that they're producing. So I thought that was really important that he spoke about that. And um, and I really wanna also speak, you know, touch on that and, and let you guys know that that is what the author, the author did not intend to, you know, write a book and have you go, oh, that's what Penobscot culture is all about. So uh, I, this is a highly recommend, this is a five star read for me. I would very much love it if you would go get yourself a copy of this book and read it because it's so, so good. And my first completed read for Skoden Readathon, so I'm very excited about that. And the last book I wanna talk about in this recent reads videos is the, another nonfiction book, this one for the prompt secret that I've completed. This is Four Lost Cities, A Secret History of the Urban Age by Annalee Newitz. Uh, which is a book that I buddy read with Britta Bowler, and it is a, a very enjoyable read. This piece of nonfiction is all about how cities have been developed in the course of human uh, population expansion. These cities have been created, and in some cases, these cities have are no longer inhabited. And in some of there's four diff different cities that she talk that they talk about in this in this book. So. It's Chattelhoyuk, which is in what's known today as Central Turkey, Pompeii in Italy, Angkor in present-day Cambodia, and Cahokia, which uh, was on the banks of the Mississippi River in present-day St. Louis. Um, and all four of these cities are no longer inhabited, and they were large, um, very large cities in their time and in their place. And in many cases, uh, archaeologists are working to um, unearth pieces of these cities and to try to understand how the cities were organized, why people moved there, and why they left. And in, in the descriptions that Newitz makes of these locations and discussions of why people maybe utilize these spaces and how they utilize the spaces, there's also a huge discussion about why people would then suddenly leave these places. And the truth of the matter is that except in the case of Pompeii, which was buried under, you know, volcanic uh, ash and lava, um, the other three places, the other three locations were not like suddenly abandoned. It happened, the changes occurred over a period of time, and the changes really were part of sort of culture and society changing and also probably climate change issues that were happening at those locations in those time frames. Um, so there was a combination of, you know, people deciding to leave because it didn't fit what they needed for survival or in their, um, their culture or in their, how they were organizing themselves or, and or there were things like floods and hurricanes and whatnot that happened and made the city unlivable. So I thought it was, it was a really fascinating read. Each of the different um, cities that's described is they're, they're similar in some ways and they're different in other ways. And so that was really fascinating to read about um, and compare and contrast each of these locations. And there's a lot of discussion about how um, dwellings were created in different time periods and what people were looking for in terms of where they lay down to sleep at night and what what things were essential um, and what you can use to to uh, determine if a place was a residential dwelling versus a uh, a building that was used for religion or spiritual purposes or commercial purposes um, and there's some clues that archaeologists use to look for these different 
uh, these different aspects to determine what the buildings were used for. The other thing that the other thing that's really interesting in this book is the descriptions of the different technologies that are used to not only discover places where cities or uh, places where people live are hidden because there's soil over the top of them or trees growing on top of them or whatever. Some of the technology that's used to even be able to tell that human habitation even occurred in places um, and other, you know, computer technologies. Um, there's uh, te technologies in the sciences that allow them to analyze materials. Like, for example, in the Cahokia s section, it talked about how they were able, archaeologists have been able to determine that probably up to a third of the residents of this community were immigrants to it. And the way that they can tell that is they analyze the teeth of the bodies that they find and be, the elements that are in the teeth tell them what people ate when they were children and the teeth were developing and certain things just weren't available to be eaten in Cahokia and they were in other parts of what we now know as North America. So, I mean, the technology has, has expanded so dramatically in the last 100 years, 50 years of archeology. span It's just amazing what they can tell about a place from very little, to me, what seems like very little material evidence. Um, so I just think that this is a, a book that really opens your mind up to how humans have lived, choices humans make about um, where to live and what's important to them at any particular time. Um, and then also this idea that you know, societies or cities collapse, right? And that what we are now learning is, you know, collapse isn't, is a, is a relative term, right? It's not it's something that happens suddenly. In a lot of cases, it's something that is an attrition thing over time. Like people make, some people make the decision to leave a city and then the people that are left can't maintain the infrastructure because there's not enough of them left. There's not enough people, there's not enough labor or there's not enough resources. And so over time, fewer and fewer people live in a particular area. Um, but like in the case of Angkor, um, there were still monks living in Angkor in the 1800s when, you know, like Western Europeans arrived there. And so like, it wasn't a lost city, right? There were still people who lived there and knew it was there. Um, so yeah, in a lot of cases, these weren't lost cities at all. They like, there were people that knew about them, but for whatever reason, people cho chose not to live there anymore. So yeah, very interesting book. Really glad that I read this one with Britta. Um, got a lot of new things to think about from reading this book, which is one of the best parts to me of Nonfiction November is the opening of your mind to new ideas and new ways of thinking about things. So these are four books that I've read in the past month so far. Uh, we're on, uh, it's November 19th as I'm filming this. I am currently reading three more nonfiction books. Uh, I'm still reading Red Famine. I am reading uh, In Cold Blood by Truman Capote. At the Edge of the Sea uh, by Rachel Carson is the last book that I'm reading. And so, Hopefully I can get those ones finished up in the next few days and come back to you and talk about those in another recent reads video. I hope you're all doing well and finding some great books to read and I will talk to you later.